Welcome, everybody, to another Commander's Film Room, um, where we get to review the top five plays from every, I'm oh, sorry, on every Tuesday at 530, we review the top five plays of the Commander's game. Uh, we are down a man with Big Doug. He's actually out sick today. Uh, you know, hopefully you're feeling well, Doug. We actually thought about wearing your T-shirts in solidarity, but we forgot today. It's all good. We couldn't coordinate in time, but uh, hopefully you're doing well. Um, I'm here with Mark Bullock. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm um, good, thanks. And yourself? Doing very well, man. You know, very happy after a win. I'm also here with Nick Ackridge. How are you doing today, sir? Good, man. Wins are uh, Monday mornings after wins are the best because my mentions are not nearly as toxic. So, 100%. I can, I can imagine. I can imagine. So today, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the progression of Sam Howell. Um, we're going to kind of look at some big plays. He had another big game today. Or, sorry, on Sunday. Uh, we had an amazing uh, Jahan Dotson touchdown we're going to review we're also going to look at the new look defense of the commander. So um, without further ado, let's jump into the film. Um, if you're in the chat, feel free to ask some questions. We'll have some live interaction and let's get started. So let me pull it up. I think Nick, are you up first? <clears throat> no, this one's all Mark. All right, Mark. Yeah. So I thought I'd start off with just um, what looks like a fairly routine and basic play, but something that we've seen how kind of struggle with this season, which is um, sort of dealing with blitzes. And this is, is not the most amazingly diverse blitz from the Patriots, but it is a somewhat disguised blitz. They've got a slot corner coming off the, the slot to the right-hand side, and he's going to be replaced by the deep safety. Um, and to replace the deep safety, they've got a safety down in the box on the left side to swing back and replace him. So they've got a bit of a coverage rotation to allow a slot blitz. Um, and this is something that Sam Howe typically you know, has, has struggled with. He hasn't identified blitzes and, and and dealt with them particularly well. And and that's not just on him as well. That's that's on the offensive line as part two. But um, as we see as this one rolls on, you can roll this into it, Nick. Um, how sees that slot coming late um, and he knows that he's going to be hot on that side. He doesn't have any protection against that slot blitz. So he quickly identifies that you know the the blitz coming from the slot the place to throw is over the top of that slot defender um he has Jahan Dotson on on that quick out um and so he shortens up his drop he doesn't take a full drop he just takes a quick step and he knows that blitz is coming um and he hits Jahan Dotson over the top of that blitz in time for for Dotson to secure that pass and and beat that safety that was rotating down from deep so um I, I thought it was just a nice play to start off to highlight that you know he he identified a blitz. Um, he adjusted his drop to, to speed things up. Um, and he threw over that blitz and, and had a successful play. So it's something that he has struggled with this year. And, and it's a good sign of progress that um, he is learning lessons um, and, and he's becoming just better as a, as a all round quarterback um, in, in, in identifying those things and, and learning how to deal with them. Yeah. I mean, it's, like Mark said, it's a it's a tiny thing. It's a little, it's a pretty simple throw once you kind of recognize what's happening. But um, we've seen multiple moments this past uh, year of him not recognizing these sort of things. Um, so it's just nice because it, you know, you beat something like this this easily, and and it's it stops defensive coordinators from you know continuously calling it and um, you know keep pressuring him with it. So it's always good to see that he makes the. Uh, this isn't really routine, but the routine kind of throws with, you know, noticing the corner blitz and. And, uh, and throwing at it. Gotcha. And it definitely seems like, you know, that's a, it's a very smart play, right? So what I was kind of interested in is if this something that happens often, right? Is this more like Eric Bannaby kind of giving him an easy outlet or like, I've always heard he's going to throw over the blitz. If you kind of see a blitz coming, kind of throw right at it or throw at that missing spot. Um, Mark, is this kind of like something that's been going on all year long? Is this like, has there been outlets for Sam or is this kind of Sam showing growth for the first time? There has been outlets for him. Um, it, it it largely depends on the protection and the scheme involved. Like mm -hmm. here, they they have only really five in protection. I think the running back might be checking before releasing, but it's really only five. Um, and so when you have um, only five blockers staying in, then typically you will have some routes that will adjust to a blitz. And and I I think this was just the cold route on the play. But mm -hmm. it could well have been a sight adjustment where John Dalton sees that guy blitzing, um, and, and the the corner kind of gives it away just before the snap. So it kind of makes it easy for him to make an adjustment, um, and, and 
that that makes it a little bit easier and, and Hal and Dotson would be on the same page at, at that point. But uh, again, I, I think it was kind of just a think that was the full route and, and Hal recognized that that guy at that spot before it was coming in and the correct situation was the Gotcha. Sounds good. All right, let us um let's go to the I call this the WTF throw. <laughs> um, Amazing the throw that, that we probably all had our breaths held for when he actually decided to throw this and saw it floating in the air for probably f- five to ten seconds. Um, but it's actually a pretty incredible play, um, and I might be giving him too much credit here uh, and noticing that they have some sort of coverage bust with this blitz. Um, but I'm going to pretend like he noticed it. So pre-snap, you know, you've got a bunch of guys up at the line. They're showing a zero blitz. Um, so you know you're going to have to get the ball out quick, make someone miss. Um, right here, this is what the coverage should look like. It's a, it's a cover three fire zone, which that means is they're going to send um, about five guys. Um, you only have six dropping back in coverage, and as you can kind of see here, you've got you've got your, your, your three deep, and then you're going to have three underneath. The problem here with the Patriots is one of these guys, one of these um, – linebackers slash corners do not do their job here. Um, and it took me a while to figure this out. I went through a lot of Patriots uh, blitzes to figure out who's who's at fault here. But um, number eight here, Juwan Benley, is supposed to you know drop off of this blitz and, and cover this curl flat over here. And um, Howell kind of notices that, you know, they all blitz, that everyone blitzes here. And there's only one guy on this side of the field, and he's dropping to a deep third. So, um, again, I could be giving him too much credit here. Um, but – you know, he does a good job of, of noticing that, you know, everyone's coming and this whole field side of the field is wide open. There's no one within 30, 30 oh, yards wow. of, of any of these guys. And then it's just incredible arm strength to make this throw. And um, it's even it's even freakier from from the end zone view to just kind of show how he uh, how he made this throw and can kind of contort his body to, to make it. So, again, pre snap, they're showing zero blitz. Everyone comes. They've got everyone coming here, so he knows. At least I think that he knows that there's only one guy dropping into a deep third. He has to bail because of a, a failed pickup of the stunt over here. Um, bails this way. Notice that no one's over there and just chucks a kind of perfect ball across the entire field, and, and it leads to a, a big game. It's amazing. There's a lot of great takeaways there. So for one, awesome arm strength, awesome off-platform throw off his back foot. Um, awesome recognition. Um, it's crazy. Once you showed the whole like cover, th- cover three, you know, drop back, it was wide open. There's actually two. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's yeah, Logan, Logan tried to make a nice diving catch there. <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. So that was impressive. Um, I like the fact that he knew that, you know, he obviously knew where the play was going. Mm-hmm. Um, to, I guess further takeaways, I guess going further, like has how would the offensive line look all together, Nick? Could you kind of have a snapshot of them throughout the game? How'd they look today? Or on Sunday? It, it was It was similar problems to last week. Okay. Um, in, in terms of, you know, the center and left guard kind of struggling with some stunts and, and picking up some stunts. There's a lot of free rushers, but again, the game plan was good where you were getting the ball out of his hands quickly. And, and Sam Howell was a lot, a lot better as we kind of just showed with that previous play. He was a lot better of getting the ball out and knowing where he needs to go, where he's hot um, and whatnot. But there were still some, some issues here between the, uh, the center and left guard. And um, I didn't mean to pick this play for that, but there's another, you know, free rusher coming through here and, You've got three blockers here. You should have three people being able to pick that stun up, but um, it looks like looks like Paul let's shouldn't hang on to ninety one so mat fat or so much and, and mm. peel off and pick up fifty five. But um, yeah, Howell makes a great play here to just. I mean that that's incredible <laughs> to throw it from there, um, completely across the field. I mean he's throwing it from his own seven yard line and it goes to the thirty two across the field. I mean it's like fifty yards in the air essentially if you think about it. So just an in- incredible play. Mark, what's your big takeaway from the play? <clears throat> uh, man, it's one of those plays where you're screaming, no, 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 no. Yes, oh, my God, what a play. <laughs> exactly. Um, the, the one question I have is, uh, do we think he knows that Logan Thomas was out there somewhere and he was just hurling it out there hoping he was going to get it? Or do you think we he saw Pringle on that crosser and thought, I can hit that? Because in the end, they're both kind of in the area. And we saw that Logan Thomas was diving for that ball. I, I thought about the same thing. And I, I think he notices Pringle. Um, yeah. You kind of see him here as he, he starts to run. He's That's looking fair. this way. and He kind of sees Pringle right here. 
He's kind yeah. of looking in this direction, and I think that's when he realizes he can just chuck this up. Um, yep. Again, I could be giving him way too much credit here, knowing that there's a coverage bust on this side. <laughs> um, but if he does notice it, it's it's just even more impressive. And, Gentlemen, I have a question in the chat. I'm going to throw up here. I'm not sure if you know the answer, but um, question from Arch. Uh, sorry if you already covered this. How is Sam handling his cadence and snap count? Is he varying it? Is that something you've noticed or picked up or kind of it's, you know, kind of something to wait and see to look at? <clears throat> it's kind of tough to pick up on film because there's no audio. Yeah. Um, uh, so it, it's kind of tough, but you haven't seen many, you know, instances of, you know, failed or miscommunication between him and the center, even with a, you know, a, second center now that he's got so that's true he's definitely you know 10 10 start you know working with his second center we don't see a lot of like you know delay a game penalties or anything like that someone's doing pretty well so i agree with that cool let's go on the next one all right next one we're going to look at the uh Jahan dotson touchdown and this Gordon's one is all mark again yeah so there i mean we could probably talk about this for the entire time of this show <laughs> if we wanted to but um, i love it there, there's so many good things from Hal in this play. Um, the, the first is kind of harping on that point that I made in the, in the first play we looked at where he's identifying a blitz. Um, the Patriots are, are showing a, a cover zero look. It's not it's not quite cover zero because they have the nose tackle drop out late, um, but it's still effectively a cover zero. It's a variation of cover zero. And you see Hal identifying that from the different clues and if you go back to a few weeks ago when there was the Giants game, we talked about how he didn't notice the um, the safety that was on one side of the offensive line that wasn't really didn't have anyone to cover on that side, so it was kind of obvious he was blitzing, but they still didn't get the the line slide correct. Um, whereas here, you can see that there's a safety over the two slot receivers. That's where the safeties are, um, and so he identifies that okay, we've got safeties over those slot receivers. I, I think everyone else is kind of creeping forward here to kind of have a blitz. Um, and so he identifies that right, it's cover zero. So he, he signals, you can see him there kind of signaling to Logan Thomas. I want Logan Thomas to come in and join the protection. Um, so Logan Thomas moves in and he accounts for the guy on the edge and Brian Robinson uh, running back slides across and, and helps him with that. And then the whole offensive line is able to slide left into where that blitz was coming from. So just as a pre-snap process, how does a really good job of identifying that I've got safeties over the slot. I've got a blitz coming. I can, I bring in Logan Thomas to help join the protection that lets me slide the line all the way to the left and, and get that blitz picked up. So from pre-snap process, that's excellent. Then post-snap we've got a, we've got a double post concept on, on the top here. So um, John Dotson's running at the inside post, Terry McClure on the outside running the outside post. Um, and typically when you run this play, Jahan Dotson's inside post route is just there to grab the safety in the middle of the field, take him out of the way and open up the, the post route from McLaurin on the outside. Um, but on this occasion, it, because it's cover zero, there's no safety in the middle of the field. So the safety is covering Jahan Dotson, which means how basically identifies, Oh, I've got Jahan Dotson one-on-one -on, -one on a safety. I'm just going to go with that. Um, so I, I saw a lot of people asking the question of, oh, hey, both of these receivers kind of end up in the same spot. Um, but is that kind of intentional? And it, the, the concept is intentional. Them ending up in the same spot isn't necessarily, but the it, it's as a result of the play. So you can you can let it run on. Nick. You can see how uh, Jahan Dotson pretty quickly beats that safety um, once the protection stuff gets sorted out and they snap the ball. Dotson beats that safety quickly and, and how pulls the trigger. Um, and I think Terry McLaurin on the outside, had he recognized that, you know, this is cover zero and Jahan Dotson's just beating a safety, he probably holds his route outside and doesn't bring, break it in quite so so hard. But I, th I think he's just thinking this is the normal double post concept and that ball's for me because the safety's being cleared out by Dotson. So he runs inside trying to get to it. Um, but yeah, here you can see he brings Thomas in, the whole line slides left, picks up that blitz. He's got plenty of time to deliver that throw. And then it's a beautiful throw down the field to Dotson. Um, and it's nice to see Dotson finally catch one on those uh, those deep shots. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's actually, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Um, 
for one, New England's kind of known for having like exotic blitz packages and kind of being complex. So it's kind of nice seeing that Sam, you know, sees the read, you know, pulls in Logan Thomas. I do like that. I love the fact that he throws the anticipation. Like, you know, it was very immediate. He knew he was going to throw it to Jahan Dotson almost immediately. It's, you know, one, two, three step drop, bam, lets it fly. And um, Jahan Dotson makes a great catch there. So, I, you know, it's really impressive. And it almost looks like the safety comes up for like press coverage, just misses maybe yeah. right here, too. And well, once you see the safety and press coverage on Dotson and then everyone comes and you know it's zero, it's a pretty easy decision after that. Um, mm-hmm. You just kind of trust Dotson to win. And there's nothing fancy about it, just straight speed and burns by him. I love it. So, gentlemen, like, you know, I know you guys study the film and you guys grind it. So two straight weeks, you see Sam Howell performing pretty well against the Eagles, Sam Howell against um, the Patriots now. Um, you know, what, are we seeing signs of growth in him? Is that kind of what – is that the takeaway? Is it Eric Benneby calling a better game? Like, what's your immediate, like, kind of, I guess, two game judgments so far? We can't have long-term projections. Yeah. What do you guys see? I, I think it's – Sam is improving leaps and bounds over some stuff that he was really, really struggling with early on. And, mm-hmm. um, again – a lot of these plays we saw in the past where there ends up being a free rusher somewhere because he doesn't kind of slide line it again. We don't know if it's him making the calls every single time, but um, here he does a good job with it. Um, or just kind of panicking and taking sacks and whatnot, but he's doing so much better with, you know, um, taking care of the blitz and getting the ball out where it needs to be and making the right decisions and very much limiting the, the mistakes other than the one really, really bad one at the end of the half. But we don't have <laughs> yeah. to talk about that. Mark, what are you thinking? Yeah, I, I'd agree. I, I think you obviously, well, in the NFL world, we live in a week-to-week overreactionary world. Um, yeah. But with a quarterback's development, especially a young quarterback, you have to take take a macro view of things. And, and rather than living in the ups and downs of each week, you have to try to think of where the guy was at the start of the year and compare that to where the guy is either now or at the end of the year, preferably. Um, and, and what we're seeing in the last few weeks is we're seeing that he is becoming a lot more efficient. Um, he's cutting down on, on the sacks that he was responsible for. Um, he's improving in areas like identifying blitzes and, and adjusting protections um, that's allowing him to have more time to take those shots down the field, as we're seeing here. Um, so there is definite improvement, but um, that doesn't mean that next week he'll be exactly the same next week exactly. he could well get sacked five or six times again and, and have three or four of those be on him you know holding on to the ball too long um, obviously you'd hope that you have a steady progression in an upward trend but it doesn't always work like that um and and so you know a few weeks ago after the giants game everyone was saying he's terrible and <laughs> give up on him and and now two weeks later ron rivera and is telling guy everyone he can i found a franchise quarterback so (laughs) you just have to you kind of have to take a zoomed out view of things and and understand that there is progression going on he still has a ways to go to prove that this is a consistent development and not just a a high of a few weeks or a low of a few weeks Exactly. Um, but he is trending in the right direction so I, i think you can be optimistically positive but um within reason I got you. I think you said it best last week, Mark. Growth isn't always linear, so he's looking you know, has yeah. it ups and downs. So we're going to kind of see how it goes there. Um, I think it's a little bit of Ron Rivera campaigning for his job a little bit because he selected yep. Sam Howell. He wants to kind of flaunt the fact that he has him. But um, the big takeaway for me, and this is a great NFL throw. He drops the ball in the bucket. Safety's coming over. He puts the ball only where Jahan Dotson can get it. It's a great catch, too. So good Yeah. Point. I mean, the 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 questions with Howell was never the the throw part. I mean, yeah. once he figured out the blitz and all that sort of stuff and got the protection right, no mm-hmm. one's doubting that he can make this throw consistently. I mean, that was mm-hmm. never a question. It was just getting to the point where you can make this throw in a pocket like this against a zero-ish blitz. Um, again, dropping your nose tackle is always fun to watch, see, but <laughs> it's still man across the board. So Greg Maneski special right there. I love it. That's that's fantastic. Uh, um, there's been too much positive going on. <laughs> so we'll talk about the massive touchdown they gave up um, to Ramondre Stevenson. <clears throat> um, and it's just a good example of why kind of run fits and, and, you know, what they call on defense matters. And it's not always what it seems. And Jonathan Vilma did a great job of um, talking about this um, after it happened uh, and just kind of explaining that while it does look very bad for David Mayo, it's, he does exactly what he needs to do. And, um, Jamin Davis was, was the culprit for, for the big part. And then, you know, just a missed tackle at the end, but 
Um, we drew up here. It's a cross dog um, blitz. So you're going to have your two linebackers. They're going to cross each other. Mayo is going to hit first. He's going to hit the first hole here, this opposite a gap. And then Davis is supposed to loop around him um, in the opposite in the other a gap problem is here is he's just a little slow to do that. And, and that leads to a big hole. So Mayo's perfectly fine here. He's in this a gap. Uh, the problem is Davis has to, he's got to fold over the top and he needs to be right here. Uh, and he gets kind of, kind of hung up there. And you, you saw um, on the broadcast Del Rio talking to Jamin after the play. And uh, he's probably telling him this thing right there is there's no reason to just, you know, kind of hold off here. He needs to, you need to get to that opposite gap. And then once this happens, you never want it to be one-on-one -on -one with a safety and um, Percy Butler doesn't make the play. And then and it's just a house call after that. But, just kind of important to show the run fits and, and whatnot. And it's not always what it seems. This is the type of play where you feel like on the Patriots side, it's like, you know, we got them in the right call. We hit, we hit everything effectively. It was a home run shot right there. And, you know, obviously Jim and Davis just couldn't get there in time, but it was, you know, it was a difficult play. Yeah. Right, run, stunts are, uh, Sorry. run stunts are difficult. Sometimes it works out great for the defense. Sometimes it puts you in a horrible spot that you can't recover. Exactly. Uh, this one should have worked out. It should have been a pretty good call. Uh, you should have had Davis kind of free here in this a gap, but you know, it just it just didn't work, and then missed some missed tackles and house call. I I also would add I think Jonathan Allen also slightly messes this up a little bit um, because he lines up on on the oh, yeah you're right on, on the guard and, and he gets kind of reached and and kicked out and that allows the the left guard to climb up and get to Jamin Davis a little bit quicker than he necessarily would have well. He wouldn't That's have true. been able to do that if, if Jonathan point. Allen had stayed in his gap. Um, so Jonathan Allen didn't help on the play as well, but Jamin Davis, you hope, is quick enough to still be able to beat the guard to the spot, um, and he wasn't. So um, I, I think that primarily Jamin Davis is at fault here. But, um, yeah, John, Jonathan Allen doesn't, certainly doesn't help him. Um, and Nick, run through that. I like that. That's a, good, that's a very good eye, Mark. I like that a lot. So he basically, because he's not lined up over the guard, the guard gets up quickly, catches Jamin Davis, and allows the running back to come through. Yeah, and then he just gets reached and, and put in the uh, the C gap here, and he needs to be – oops. And then I guess while we're waiting to go back to that clip, is, is Deron Payne doing anything poorly here? Or is this a great play by the guard? He, he seems like his body's kind of turned in the wrong he's, direction. <clears throat> he's fine here. He's in the B gap. He This is what he needs to do. He needs okay. to kind of get across here, and he's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, he can't really do anything for the play hitting in the A gap here. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's just basically Jonathan Allen should be in the B gap, which should occupy the guard for a – it should occupy the guard, but it should certainly occupy him for longer than it did, um, which um, because Allen kind of stunts outside a little bit and the the tackle kind of gets him and pins him outside, the guard is able to get off quicker and get to Jamie Davis earlier. Um, yeah. So that makes it a little bit harder for D Davis to, to um, you know, make his gap. But uh, you would still hope that Jamie Davis is able to hit that quicker than he does. Um, and you, you obviously, you know, a linebacker is meant to be more athletic than a guard. So you hope that he's able to beat the guard to the spot and, and go make the play regardless. Makes sense. All right. Enough of the negatives. We'll, <laughs> we'll go back to some positives, um, some Emmanuel Forbes stuff. And yeah. I don't, know which one you, I don't know which one you want to start first. with, but. I, I showed up, I put a bunch of clips up there so we can start whichever one you want to start with. But this is uh, him dropping into zone, yeah. So, th this is something they, they didn't do particularly often in this game. Um, it, it's something I would like to see them do more often with him because he was drafted to be a kind of zone match corner. Um, and in this game, weirdly, they, they played a ton of cover one, but um, you can see how much more comfortable he is when he's playing zone coverage when he's allowed to play off and with vision. Um, He's responsible for a deep quarter here. It's just quarters coverage. Um, and if we go back to, yeah, you can see how he uses his kind of shuffle technique. He, he's able to play with vision on both the, the quarterback and the receiver. Um, he just opens his, his hips. And you can see how he can see through the receiver to the quarterback. And that allows him to read both the quarterback for the throw and the receiver for what whatever route they're running. Um, and you can see how he... He reads that receiver breaking out 
pretty early on he he anticipates that that route very well um and, and almost runs it for the receiver and and kind of makes it impossible for mac jones to fit that throw in there um and, and as a result jones kind of has to throw it way towards the sideline to give his receiver any chance of making a play instead of forbes and and in the end it falls incomplete but yeah i i just thought it was a it was a nice rep of, of forbes in zone coverage and, and something uh we haven't seen him have the opportunity to do that often he, yeah he, he's a guy that they drafted specifically to fit their kind of zone and, and match coverage schemes and they they weirdly gone away from that for, for some reason um, <laughs> it, it, it's it was it's one of the weirdest things ever because you know you, you you go and get a guy and he fits perfectly into your scheme and then you decide to you know try a different scheme randomly and it's just it's very very strange but yeah this is what he did a ton at mississippi state um, and it allows him to just kind of, like Mark said, just play off and be able to read it more instead of just trying to play press man. And um, I hope they keep doing this more. But, again, they did play a lot of man coverage this past week, and that probably had a lot to do with, you know, the Patriots receivers not being, you know, the the best. But they tried the same thing with the Bears receivers, who other than DJ Moore aren't very great, and uh, DJ Moore kind of kind of toasted them for it. So exactly. um, hopefully that's not the same this coming week against the, uh, against the Seahawks. It is interesting. So I, you know, I think Emmanuel Forbes is known for being that ball hawk, having that instinct to kind of break on the ball and kind of watch the ball come in in zone. So I like seeing more of this um, as part of the gameplay. And I just like the fact that they are they were smart about deploying him against the Patriots, right? The wide receivers are not Stephon Diggs and AJ Brown that got that he saw earlier in the year. So it's kind of good to get his feet underneath him. Um, you know, I guess we're going to kind of hint at this. Like, were you overall happy with his performance, guys? Or what are your thoughts so far? <clears throat> oh yeah. That's why it's why my mentions weren't as as toxic <laughs> as they were in past weeks. When you get when you get someone with a 90 plus grade, um, especially your first round rookie corner, um everybody's yeah, happy. Yeah, everyone's everyone's happy with that. But no, it was just a great performance. Um we we charted him with seven targets. He allowed two catches for 12 yards, and the big thing was four forced incompletions. Mm. Um so it's just I mean, that's what you drafted him for to, to make plays on the ball and should have should have came away with a pick, but um you know, we'll, we'll save that for another day. Yeah. Um, and on this clip, I, I've got two different uh, plays sewn together in this clip. So the, the first one is a, a really quick slant. And, and you can see he's isolated one-on-one with this receiver outside who's just trying to win quickly on a, on a quick slant. And obviously Forbes does well in the end. Um, but if, if we just go back to that first slant um, and – there's a few technical things that you'd, you'd like to see him do a little bit better. Um, off the snap here, he gets his hips open very quickly, um, and better receivers will probably cut across his face, chop his arm down, and stop him from recovering. Um, but what we do see is the athletic ability that he does have. He's, he's able to adjust his feet, flip his hips incredibly quickly, um, to get himself back into a somewhat decent position. Um, and then he's still kind of, the receiver still kind of has his body in front of him, but he's he's got the arm length to be able to still reach in and get his hand in at the catch point and, and make sure that that catch can't be made. Um, but later on in the game, th- this was a similar route. It was a little bit deeper. It wasn't an instant slant. We, saw, we see Forbes be a lot more patient. He doesn't open himself up immediately. And that means he's able to stick with the receiver a lot tighter into the route. Um, and when when the receiver goes to break, Forbes is on his outside hip and he's able to sit in a good position where he can look back for the throw and undercut the route as opposed to trying to wrap around the top of the guy and, and get his hand in at the catch point. This time he's able to undercut the route um, and that's a much better position for him to be in to be able to make a play on the ball. Um, and, you know, as you can see on, on this one, he's able to make that play on that ball and, and, and break it up. So um, both reps were, you know, the pass was incomplete, so they were decent. But you could see that there there is some technique work that he needs to improve on. Um, and you'd like to see him be just that little bit more patient rather than biting so heavily on that initial jab step and, and, and relying on trying to cut that guy off with his hand because a, a, a better receiver will chop that hand away and and get inside of him. But, um, you know, he was able to get away with it here. And then later in the game, you see that that technique is a little bit better and and he's, he's a little bit more patient at the snap that he gets into a better position on the receiver's outside hip. 
Um, and knowing that he has that safety help inside on this play probably helps that as well. Um, and then from because he's in that position on his outside hip, he's able to turn his head as the receiver breaks inside either quarterback and, and undercut the route to make a play on the ball. So, And that's exactly what you want a guy like Forbes to be doing when, when he is up in press coverage. You, you want him to be still be able to locate the ball and, and, and making plays on it and undercut her out. So, um, yeah, I think as we've kind of touched on, both Nick and I would like to see him more in off coverage and zone coverage. But mm. if he's going to play man coverage, you want to see him improving his technique where he's doing a lot more like this, where he's positioning himself better. He's a little bit more patient at the at the snap and not biting on the first move of the release. He's, he's waiting for the receiver to declare their intention and then sticking to their hip and, and positioning himself so that he can undercut throws and, and make plays on the ball. This is a difficult question. I know it might be hard to gauge. Have you seen a lot of growth from him from that, that little benching period where he kind of had to sit out and kind of watch from the sidelines or is he just have a good game or it's too early to tell? What do you guys have so far on that? I think it's a, a little too early to tell. I okay. mean, obviously you want him to perform like this against, you know, these types of receivers, but he's going to have a lot bigger of a test this next week against the Seahawks. Yeah, great core. Um, so the, the jury is still out and it's going to still be out. It's the same thing with Sam Howell. Like you, you yeah. can't make judgments this quickly. Um, it's, I guess this is only like his fourth really game because he was benched for a couple times, but fourth or mm-hmm. fifth game. And so you can't make these judgments too quickly. You can't write them off too quickly. You can't call him a bus. And now you can't, you know, um, say he's back and he's, this is why you drafted him the, in the first round and all that stuff after one good game. So um, I know it's tough, but just kind of hold off on, on the praise for right now. See if he can string a couple more weeks together. And he's not going to have a 90 plus grade and have four four cent completions and only allow two catches every single week. And, there could be some weeks where it's just, you know, allow five catches for 50 yards or whatever. And that's still a lot better than, than what it was in the past. So um, it's just a, a slow, slow growth. And that's kind of what the rest of the season should be. It's a kind of a growing exactly process right. for, for all of the young players. Exactly right. We got one more Forbes one. Yeah. The last Forbes one I put in there was um, kind of talking about how you mentioned how if we see some growth from him and then, and, and this was a play where, one of the few times the Patriots actually tried to attack him with a double move. And obviously we've seen double moves be a problem for him this season. Um, And and I think we see a little bit of a difference in him here than what we saw earlier in the season, because he knows he has the quickness to jump on those routes underneath. He doesn't need to be so tight. And you can see the difference here is that he's given himself a cushion. He's five yards off the receiver when they're breaking inside and, and, he still bites up in position ready to attack that route as it breaks inside, but he gives himself the cushion to stay on top of the route for if that receiver then fakes that bite, that move inside and, and breaks up the field. So uh, by giving himself that cushion, he's he knows he still has the athleticism and the quickness to break on something if it, if it is a, a route that breaks over the middle or underneath or whatever, but he also gives himself the cushion to be able to recover if that receiver does turn into a double move. And um, so you can see that that cushion as, as the, the play goes through, he, he really gives himself a chance to stay on top of it. And he still makes a bit of an error here. Um, he kind of assumes that that receiver is fading out to the sideline and, and he kind of gets himself mixed up and, and has to use a speed turn to get back out of it. And if that throw had been more towards the middle of the field, he might've been in trouble, but um I, I think the main takeaway from this play is how he's given himself more of a cushion um, and, and that allows him the chance to recover if that receiver does run a double move as they do on this play. Um, so um, if you're looking for signs of growth from him, um, this is potentially one. Um, obviously, this was only one rep. <laughs> um, and so you, you have to see him do that consistently. Um but that if you're looking for a sign of growth of something that he was really struggling with earlier in the year um, and something he really struggled with in college as well, those double yeah. moves have been a, a, a long issue for him. So um, to be able to give himself that little bit of extra cushion for um, you, you want him to be tight to receivers. You want him to be able to make plays on the ball, but he has that quickness to make up ground if he's driving down on routes underneath. Um, so he doesn't need to be so tight to them he can afford to give himself that extra five yards because he can make up that ground 
and by doing that he he gives himself just that little bit of extra protection against that that double move if it does happen i like yeah. it. he kind of creates a little margin of error to kind of like play around with the quarterback and kind of jump on it if he needs to sorry yep. Nick, go ahead <clears throat> no i was just about to say that this was a massive problem in college like mark said like if you just watch his tape it's it's jumping he's jumping everything <laughs> there was never a moment where he wasn't going to try to jump a route um and we saw it again in the nfl and the, the eagles kind of you know really went at him because of it and, and this is a lot a lot better um like mark said just kind of keep that cushion here there's no reason to kind of jump that gives himself a nice five yard cushion able to recover and um yeah just a much much better rep Something that pops to me, you know, I know this is a manual Forbes play, but on the top, I, I don't know what edge rusher is coming from the top of the play. He's coming in quick. He, I don't know if it's a blitz or what's going on right there. That's that's a, a, yeah, that's Quan Martin, who only okay. gets like 10 snaps a game. <laughs> that's he came a in flying. I mean, it's a little bit flat. He flew, flew by the quarterback, but definitely uh, some jump on the ball right there. I think mm. it's more of a really deep drop from the quarterback than anything. Mm. Um, the tight end does just enough to kind of keep him away from the quarterback here and uh, but yeah, no, he, he makes plays for whatever reason. He, he only plays like, um, I think he had 15 snaps this past week, which was the most he's had. Um, but that only happened really because they went really uh DB heavy on that last drive that the, the Patriots had. And that's where he was playing yeah. a lot gotcha. um, before that. He, he still was not playing very often. Um, so again, I, I, I want to see the young guys. I want to see them, them get a, get a shot here. Um, because when he is in the game, he makes plays. So exactly. I just want to see more of them. Yeah, it's the point of the season, right? Just developing, you know, we're not going to win the Super Bowl this year per se. So let's go out there and kind of develop our players and see how it goes. Yep. Cool. How many more do we got, guys? I think that's it. That was all I had. Yep. Um, I, I thought that Dalton touchdown was going to take us the entire <laughs> show. So <laughs> I guess, gentlemen, you know, to kind of wrap up the show, like what's one positive takeaway you take away from the game so far? And what's like one area of growth you want to see kind of moving forward? I guess start off with you, Mark. <clears throat> Uh, well, I, I think the overwhelming positive is the efficiency we've seen with Sam Howe play um, in back-to-back -back games so far. Um, and, and that's obviously th the biggest question with him this season has been his ability to avoid sacks. And, and he struggled with holding onto the ball and, and taking sacks that he just doesn't need to take. Um, mm -hmm. And and so we're, we've seen these past two games that he's you know capable of developing. He, he is starting to understand that okay, I, I can identify different markers and coverage where whether it's a, a safety over a slot receiver when they wouldn't typically be or it's a, a corner out of position, um, you know, some, some sort of identifier pre-snap that there might be a blitz coming that way. So I need to adjust the protection to get that picked up. Um, or maybe it's I don't need to adjust the protection. I know I've got a receiver running the right route and I can just throw over that blitz. So I just need to adjust my drop to get the ball out quicker um, as we saw in the, the first play of this. So um, yeah, I think that is the big overwhelming positive is that we're, we're seeing um, development and growth from how in that regard. Um, I think if there's a, a negative, um, you know, we kind of touched it on it a little bit that the offensive line is still not great. Um, I've kind of been saying the whole year, the offensive line has been good enough for the quarterback to be efficient, but they're, they're not good enough for the quarterback to be anything but efficient. And I think that is still kind of holding true. Um, even with the changes that they've made, uh, I don't think uh, Tyler Larson's made a difference in terms of the calls and, and making sure that the, the right people are going to the right defenders. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so things aren't being mistargeted quite so often, but in terms of physically blocking people and handling like stunts and stuff, they're, they're still having issues up front. Um, and maybe not quite so much as say in that Giants game where it was just horrendous, but yeah. um, it, it's still not great. Um, so uh, yeah, you, that that's still a negative. Um, but the offensive line in general is still playing well enough for how to be efficient and how it has developed to a point where at least in these past few games he is being efficient enough to overcome those issues up front, and and that's why the offense has been successful the past few games. Yeah, so the growth of Sam Howell, the offensive line, still kind of a question. Nick, what are you seeing? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, those were going to be my two answers as well. Uh, <laughs> the O-line has been a hot topic for all of Twitter the whole entire year. And, you know, when Sam was taking a bunch of sacks, it was all the offensive lines fall. Now he's not taking sacks. It's none of their faults. And just breaking down the film kind of shows you that there's still problems there. And it, it's 
offensive line play can really be kind of masked by quarterback play and, and whatnot. And you just kind of have to kind of rewatch and, and just kind of see what's going on. And, and Sam Howell has done a much, much better job, which is why we're not seeing as many sacks. But like Mark said, there's still a problem there between that, that center and left guard. Um, that, that, that a gap right there is where you see a lot of free rushers come through the, come through there. Um, but if I had to pick something different than him, um, okay. appreciate that. I would, I would say, I would say some good is, is Jahan Dotson I mean, back to back mm. weeks where he's, he's really kind of, um, torch DBs. And there was one more drop this week. Maybe we have to start worrying about that soon, but, um, there is still, he's just torching DBs and it's nice to him to see him finally kind of get rewarded with, with the ball. Um, he was still kind of open in, in previous weeks, but it's nice to see him get rewarded. Um, as for the one negative, it's, it's the defensive line. And, and mostly for me, it's the interior too. I think I haven't really seen enough from, from Allen and Payne this year to really kind of um, get too excited. We obviously know we're going to lose a lot of pressures and sacks and whatnot from, from the edge with, with no chase young and Montez sweat, but um, I would really like to see those, those two interior guys really kind of, you know, step it up. And it, it's been a, um, it's been a bit of a down year for, for the two of them. So I'd say that's one, my one negative. Gotcha. And actually last question, because I didn't actually ask you, how do you guys feel about the whole trade? I didn't ask you about Montez Sweat and uh, Chase Young leaving. Do you guys have a preference or thoughts on that? I talked about it a lot with, with, uh, with, Doug, Doug, last week? with okay. Doug last week. So I, I'll let Mark take over. I know he's been getting killed at, on Twitter sometimes with, <laughs> with some Chase Young talk. Yeah. Uh, I, it was a, it was a very up and down day for me, that trade deadline day. Cause <laughs> when, when they traded Montez Sweat, I thought, and the return that they got from that, that bare second round pick, which, can end up being a, a top three or five pick in that second round. I thought that was tremendous value. I, I thought that was top end value that they could have got from Montez Sweat. And I thought it it solved that whole issue of can we pay both of these guys? How do we keep all these guys? And okay, well, now we've traded one. That means we can tie down the other and, and uh, we can make that work. Um, and then a few hours later, they go ahead and trade Chase Young anyway. And uh you know, clearly there was stuff going on behind the scenes where there was some sort of disconnect between Chase Young and and either the coaching staff or Ron Rivera or or some people in that building. Um, whoever it was, clearly they 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 had some sort of problem with Chase Young. Um, but from just watching purely the film, I mean, Ch- Chase Young was was their best defensive lineman this year, um, and he was their main source of pressure. Um, as Nick said, Allen and Payne haven't quite been up to scratch this year. Um, and, and part of the reason Allen has struggled has, has been a little bit to do with being matched up with with Young on that side. And, and they both kind of try to attack the same gap sometimes. But um, in general, Chase Young has been the, their primary source of pressure. Um, and to see him, when you have a guy with his talent starting to fulfill that talent at only 24 years old, you kind of feel like that should be a building block for the future, not a guy that you're trading away for a late third round pick. So um, I didn't love that trade. I, I didn't love the fact that less than an hour after that trade, there was the quote of it being addition by subtraction. Um, if, if that was actually the case, why the hell are you even playing Chase Young? Um, <laughs> like you're in a, you're in a year where you need to win games. If you think Chase Young is hurting your chances of winning them, you bench him. They had no issues benching their first round pick. They should not have any issues benching a guy that has hardly played the last few years. So um, that was nonsense to me. Obviously, Chase Young has been their best defensive lineman and their main source of pressure. So uh, I didn't like that at all. Um, but clearly, there there is belief in that building that there's something up with Chase Young, whether it's some sort of character thing or they just didn't mesh with him. Um, or maybe they were worried about that knee and 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 paying him long term with that knee injury, um, and, and that's something that's something only they would know. Um, so yeah. p- perhaps that is the case that they they are worried that that knee will not hold up to that long term contract. In which case, trading him for whatever you could get makes sense. But um, without knowing that information, just going off of the film, uh, I did not like that at all. Yeah, I mean that was that was kind of my thoughts um, last week when I when I was talking with Doug. It's th- this is everything that you were looking for when you declined the fifth year option. What he was doing on the field is everything that you were kind of looking for and wanted to see from him. 
and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago where he was varying his different pass rush moves and all that sort of stuff. And that was something you hadn't seen his rookie year. And you don't even have to believe us. There are some people out there who do great work with offensive linemen and defensive linemen who were saying the same thing about Chase Young, that this was his, his best year since his rookie year. Um, so it was just, it was tough to see. I, I have a feeling that they're going to regret this in a couple of years, but um, there was very clearly a, a fractured relationship there um, because like Mark said, not even like an hour after the trade, it was just leaking comments left and right. And that was, that was some uh, old owner stuff. So hopefully that doesn't keep happening. I agree. Uh, maybe we just, you know, completely start all over, but there was clearly something going on between him and the coaching staff and maybe some of his teammates as well with kind of what he's talking about with, with the San Francisco media and stuff. And yeah, I just, just the player and what he was doing on the field, I think you're going <clears> to <throat> very clearly you're going to miss. I mean, th this past week was rough in terms of pass rush. They, were, they only had 10 pressures. That was the fewest they've had this entire year. And edge rushers were, were pretty non-existent other than the, the KJ Henry roughing the passer <laughs> and stack, but that one kind of came on an unblocked um, pressure as well. So it's going to be tough. I, I do think they're going to regret it. I think I think Chase Young was was looking was looking really really good, but we don't know everything that was going on behind the scenes, so um, we can only kind of comment on what we see on the field. I'm right there with you. We don't have to dwell on it too much. I'm right. I have the same mindset though. I feel like as a 24 year old asset, potentially growing with the coaching staff that might be changing next year. If there if the issues with the coaching staff, then potentially we could try something new next year. But I guess you know. Got to keep it moving and fresh slate for next year. So we'll see how that goes. But um, gentlemen, I love learning from you this week. It's awesome for those viewers that are watching us. I appreciate it. Every Tuesday at 530, Commander's Film Room. We have a great um, matchup next week against the Seattle Seahawks. Kenneth Walker, Jesse Smith and Jigba, DK Metcalf. It's be very interesting. Looking forward to it. Great defensive line on their part, too. Gentlemen, have a great night. Everyone else, peace out. Thanks, guys.